Hey, what's going on everyone? In this video, we'll talk about how the weights in an artificial neural network are initialized, how this initialization affects the training process, and what you can do about it. So let's get to it. In an artificial neural network, we know that weights are what connect the nodes between layers. To kick off our discussion on weight initialization, we're first going to discuss how these weights are initialized and how these initialized values might negatively affect the training process. With this in mind, we'll then explore what we can do to influence how this initialization occurs. Then we'll see how we can specify how the weights for a given model are initialized in code using Keras. All right, let's get started. So how are weights even initialized in the first place? We briefly touched on this concept in our videos on backpropagation. Recall there, we mentioned that weights are randomly initialized. To elaborate, whenever we build and compile a network, the values for the weights will be set with random numbers, one random number per weight. Typically, these random numbers will be normally distributed such that the distribution of these numbers has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So how does this random initialization impact training? To see this, let's consider the following example. Say that our neural network's input layer has 250 nodes, and say for simplicity that the value of each of these 250 nodes is one. Now let's focus only on the weights that connect the input layer to a single node in the first hidden layer. In total, there will be 250 weights connecting this node in our first hidden layer to all the nodes in the input layer. Now, each of these weights were randomly generated and normally distributed with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So what does this mean for the weighted sum Z that this node accepts as input? Note in our case, all the input nodes have a value of one. So each weight in Z will be multiplied by a one. So Z becomes just a sum of the weights. So back to how this random initialization affects Z. More specifically, we want to know what this means for the variance of Z. Stick with me for a sec, we'll see why we care about this in a minute. Well, z as a sum of normally distributed numbers with a mean of zero will also be normally distributed around zero, but its variance, and similarly its derived standard deviation, will be larger than one. That's because the variance of a sum of independent random numbers is the sum of the variances of each of these numbers. So since the variance for each of our random numbers is one, that means the variance of z, which is the sum of these 250 numbers, is 250. Taking the square root of this value, we see that z has a standard deviation of about 16, 15.811 to be exact. So looking at the normal distribution of z, we see that it's quite broader than a normal distribution with a standard deviation of one. So you ask, who cares? Well, with this larger standard deviation, the value of z is more likely to take on a number that is significantly larger or smaller than one. When we pass this value to our activation function, then if we're using sigmoid, for example, we know that most positive inputs, especially these that we're saying will be significantly larger than one, will be mapped to one. And similarly, most negative inputs will be mapped to zero. If the desired output for our activation function is on the opposite side from where it's saturated, then during training when SGD updates the weights and attempts to influence the activation output, it will only make very small changes in the value of this activation output, barely even incrementally moving it in the right direction. Thus, the network's ability to learn becomes really hindered, and training is stuck running in this slow and inefficient state. If you're a little shaky on the concept of activation functions, be sure to check out the video earlier in this playlist that covers this concept in detail. These problems that we've discussed so far with weight initialization also contribute to the vanishing and exploding gradient problem that we talked about last time. So given that this random weight initialization causes issues and instabilities with training, can we do anything to help ourselves out here? Can we change how weights are initialized? I'm glad you asked. Yes. Yes, we can. In hindsight, we should be able to look back at the problems we discussed and trace them back to being caused by the weighted sum taking on a variance that is relatively large. So to tackle this problem, what we can do is force this variance to be smaller. Sweet, but how? Well, 
Since the variance of the input for a given node is determined by the variance of the weights connected to this node from the previous layer, we need to shrink the variance of these weights, which will shrink the variance of the weighted sum. Some researchers identified a value for the variance of the weights that seems to work pretty well to mitigate the earlier problems we discussed. This value for the variance of the weights connected to a given node is 1 over n, where n is the number of weights connected to this node from the previous layer. So rather than the distribution of these weights being centered around 0 with a variance of 1, which is what we had earlier, they're now still centered around 0, but with a significantly smaller variance, 1 over n. It turns out that to get these weights to have this variance of 1 over n, what we do is, after randomly generating the weights centered around 0 with variance 1, we multiply each of them by the square root of 1 over n. Doing this causes the variance of these weights to shift from 1 to 1 over n. This type of initialization is referred to as Xavier initialization, and also Glorot initialization. It's important to note that actually, if we're using ReLU as our activation function, which is highly likely, then this ideal value for the variance is 2 over n rather than 1 over n. Besides that, everything else I've stated so far for this solution is the same. This value just happens to be what works better for ReLU. Also, note that given how we defined n as being the number of weights connected to a given node from the previous layer, we can see that this weight initialization process occurs on a per layer basis. And another thing also worth noting is that when this Xavier initialization was originally announced, it was suggested to use 2 over n in plus n out, where n in is defined as the number of weights coming into a given neuron, and n out is the number of weights going out of this neuron. Just wanted to mention that because you'll probably still see that value referenced in some places. Now, we've talked a lot about this Xavier initialization. Aside from this one, there are other initialization techniques that you can explore, but this Xavier initialization is currently one of the most popular and has the aim to reduce the vanishing and exploding gradient problem. Let's see now how we can specify a weight initializer for our own model and code using Keras. All right, we're in our Jupyter notebook and we have this arbitrary model here that we've used in previous videos. This model has two hidden dense layers and an output layer with two nodes. Now, almost everything shown on the screen right now has been covered in previous videos of this playlist, so we won't touch on these items individually. Instead, we'll focus on the one single thing we haven't yet seen before, and that's this kernel initializer parameter in the second hidden layer. This is the parameter we use to specify what type of weight initialization we want to use for a given layer. Here, I've set the value equal to glorot underscore uniform. This is the Xavier initialization using a uniform distribution. You can also use glorot underscore normal for Xavier initialization using a normal distribution. Now, actually, if you specify nothing at all, by default, Keras initializes the weights in each layer with this glorot uniform initialization. And this is true for other layer types as well, not just dense. Convolutional layers, for example, also use the glorot uniform initializer by default as well. So for each layer, we can just choose to leave the initializer as this default one, or if we don't want to use glorot uniform, we can explicitly state the value for the kernel initializer parameter that we want to use, like glorot normal, for example. There are several other initializers that Keras supports besides the two we just mentioned, and they're all documented on Keras' website. So hey, lucky us, Keras has been initializing these weights for us using Xavier initialization this whole time without us even knowing. What we can draw from this entire discussion is that weight initialization plays a key role in how well and how quickly we can train our networks. And it all links back to the idea of the inputs to our neurons having large variance when we just randomly generate a normally distributed set of weights. So to combat this, we can just shrink this variance. And we saw that doing this actually wasn't that bad. And really, in Keras, it's not bad at all, because it's already done for us. So what do you think of this concept of weight initialization? After our discussion, is it clear how this can negatively impact training? Also, if you're using another neural network API besides Keras, let us know in the comments if initialization is already being done for you by default. And if it is, is it Xavier initialization? I think it'd be interesting to hear about how different solutions are implemented. Thanks for watching. See you next time.